hi everyone. How many of you know what incense is? Do you like the smell of incense? I'm Philip Shields, founder of Light on the Rock. I'm not a big fan of incense myself. At least the ones I've come in contact with, probably nothing to do with the kind of incense God used in the tabernacle. So for some of us, maybe we don't care for the smell of incense, especially in certain stores, hippie type stores or whatever, it depends. It depends, right? But do you know that God loves the smell, the aroma of the incense recipe he created? And he even made it a law that he wanted his incense to be refreshed twice a day in his temple or tabernacle at the morning and evening sacrifice times. That was about 9 a.m. or about mid, mid to late afternoon. And then he kept burning, he wanted them burning the incense all day and night long. He loved even more what the incense represents. God loved that even more, and I'll describe that soon. But realize that this was a fragrance smell to God, a fragrance God pleased, was very pleased to have. What did incense picture? Be turning to Psalm 141. <clears throat> you might be surprised. What was the point of this altar of incense that was just in front of the veil going into the Holy of Holies? What was the point of this altar of incense burning a kind of smoke inside the tabernacle's first room that God likes so much? I'm sure some of that fragrance, the odor, the, uh, the smell of it wafted through, went through the veil into the into the Holy of Holies as well. Psalm 141, verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> Lord, I cry out to you, make haste to me. Give ear to my prayer when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So he's calling even his prayer as he described it with incense. He described it with lifting up of hands. So your prayers are seen by God or accepted as a nice scent, an odor, uh, a good odor by God. He loved it. Just a fragrance, uh, just like the sweet fragrance of the incense from the altar of incense. I'm hoping actually the sermon today will help improve and revive your prayers. It's certainly starting to do that for mine, just preparing for it. In Psalm 141, verse 2, David also mentions praying with uplifted hands or arms. I've spoken on that several times. Are you praying with your hands raised up towards God? So many of you refuse to do that because it makes you think of what certain other Protestant groups or others do they are, are groups that you don't you don't belong to, you don't agree with, so you don't do it. Like lifting up your raised hands. Forget the others. Just do what God says. Try doing it more and more. You'll get very comfortable with it. God loves the uplifted hand. He does love it. And he loves prayer as incense. <clears throat> but mainly today I want to cover just how are our prayers like incense. Have you ever thought of your prayers being as incense? And what that could mean. That's our topic today. Realizing that our prayers are to God a sweet smelling fragrance. Like incense. How does that happen? Well, there was in the tabernacle, later in the temple, just in front of the veil in the holy going leading to the Holy of Holies, an altar called the altar of incense. It was actually pretty small. Fairly small, made of acacia wood, then covered completely in gold. It was about a foot and a half wide and about a foot and a half long and about three feet high, less than a meter high. God commanded the priest to burn incense on this golden altar every morning and every evening, exactly at the same time the burnt offerings were happening outside on the big brazen altar. Uh, when those were happening, the burning of the incense was supposed to also happen around nine o'clock and around three o'clock or a little bit later the incense was actually left burning continually it's a sweet smelling aroma to Jehovah it was made up of four equal parts of precious spices 
and God didn't allow just anybody to use it. It was just his own fragrance, aroma. He didn't want everybody else using it. If you did, you could die for it, okay? <laughs> I'm hoping this teaching today will inspire, sober us up, refresh the way we approach God Most High, our Abba, our Father in Heaven, when we pray, and it may even change the way we pray. Keep in mind, I hope it does, actually, Keep in mind that God's ingredients for his incense would not be at all like the woodstock or the hippie incense you smell in their shops. God's incense was considered holy and made up of equal parts of four very precious spices. Uh, the ingredients were stacti, um, onica, galbanum, and frankincense. The stacti could have been myrrh or something very close to it or a gum resembling myrrh. Remember the gifts given to the uh, to uh, Yeshua when the kings arrived, the the young the young child Yeshua, no longer in the manger when the kings arrived, was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So two of the spices for the incense included frankincense and myrrh or, or stacte. The onica, onica was actually this surprised me was actually the shell of a perfumed mollusk which when burned yielded a very musky order. Now by itself probably wouldn't be very nice, but it was supposed to be mixed up. The galbanum was a gum that you got from cutting into a bark or a shrub of that re region, a gum. And then when it burned, it also had a certain fragrance. Frankincense was a pale yellow semi-transparent resin that was fragrant when burned. These were mixed together, remember. Turn to Luke 1. John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was inside the first room of the tabernacle, the holy place. That's where the menorah, the, the, candle, uh, alabra, uh, the candelabra, the menorah, and the altar of incense were, and the table of showbread. And he was about to offer the incense when the mighty angel Gabriel, who appears before God, appears before the, the, the fiery stones of God, appeared suddenly. He was right there. He imagined he thought he thought it was all by himself. And suddenly, Gabriel, God's, it never calls him an archangel, but I suppose he could have been, but I, we, he's not called that, appeared suddenly with good tidings to him. Uh, Gabriel seems to be the one who brought messages to Daniel, to Mary, and to other ones. Luke 1, verses 8 to 13. And so it was, while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division. They had, I think, 24 divisions. He was one of them. One, and he was in one of those divisions. According to the custom of the priesthood, his, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying. Notice that. They were praying outside at the hour of incense also called the hour of prayer different times. Verse 11, I want you to notice the praying and the incense. Verse 11, then an angel of the Lord, verse 19 says it was Gabriel. An angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. There's nobody there, then suddenly here's this mighty angel. And when Zacharias, Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zacharias. I think the Hebrews might say Zacharias. But anyway, uh, don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Again, prayer, altar of incense, all tied together. And your wife, who is now a very old woman, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. John means gift of God. Here, Incense is being connected with effective answered prayer. I want you to think about that. If you want more answered prayer, uh, I hope you really listen carefully to this sermon. Maybe listen to it twice and put into practice the things that I'll be showing you from Scripture. Let's read more Scriptures about prayer and incense tied together. Your prayers, remember, are going somewhere. It's not just your voice mouthing words. They go nowhere. Sometimes we feel that way. No, if, if you're in a room with incense, you're very aware of that incense. 
If you were blind, you'd be aware of it. If you were deaf, you'd be aware of it. God is aware of your prayer. There's no way you'd be in a room full of incense without being aware of the incense. The incense pictures your prayers. God is aware when we pray. He's aware of what you're saying. That's what I'm trying to say here. Now let's go up to heaven. God most high is on his throne. And on the side of the throne in Revelation 5 is a scroll with seals on it. And nobody at first was able to open the seals or was worthy to. This affects John so much he starts to weep. Let's read it. We're in, we're in Revelation 5. And so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to even look at it. But one of the elders, one of the 24 elders around God's throne said, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. This was Christ. As though it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. He took the, the scroll out of the right hand of God Most High. Now verse 8. Revelation 5, verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of, what? Full of incense, which are the prayers Prayers of who? Prayers of the saints. Remember in most of the epistles, the Apostle Paul refers to the ones he was writing to as the saints. Holy ones. Saints means holy ones. Those who are filled with God's Holy Spirit. That's what, that's what makes you a saint. So, the four living creatures, 24 elders, fell down before God, each one of them having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Your prayers are up there. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Those of you in Kenya, that includes you. The saints, those of you in Tanzania, that, inclu that includes you as saints. Those of you in America, Canada, Mexico, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Russia, all the Muslim countries. If God's calling you and filling you with his Holy Spirit out of that into his truth and gives you his Holy Spirit, your prayers of the saints are like incense. So... Turn next to Revelation 8. We are in Revelation 5 a while ago. So your very prayers, which you don't think are so powerful maybe, are what the bowls of incense pictured. You. Your prayers. <clears throat> like I said, you can't miss it when there's incense in the air. And your prayers can't be missed either. They won't go unnoticed. Do you wonder if your prayers for Christ to return soon are heard? Does it seem fruitless? Well, watch this. Remember, David said, May my prayers be set before you as incense. Revelation 8, verses 1 to 6. And then he opened the seventh seal, and there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, and then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was in front of the throne. Just like on earth, the altar of incense was in front of the ark, which is the mercy seat, 
the throne of God. It was out. It was there was a veil in between them. But anyway, the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Notice again your prayers, prayers of the saints wafting up there before God. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And so the seven angels, who had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. So this was incense offered with your prayers. It's time now for, it's time for the seventh seal. They've opened the seventh seal. It's time for the seventh seal with the seven trumpets. So the first six seals in Revelation 6 have been broken already, been broken open. And <clears throat> the four horsemen of the apocalypse have ridden. The great tribulation has been going on. The horrifying heavenly signs, uh, seal number six and folly stars, it's been a time. It's been a time, I'm sure, when you all would be praying a lot. And we're told just before the seventh seal, God hears your prayers as incense. And it's time for the seven trumpet plagues, which is what the seventh seal is. It's composed of seven trumpet plagues of revelation. And your prayers as incense was all a part of that. Isn't that beautiful? Are you getting it? Our prayers are like a fragrant fragrance to God, incense to God. Your prayers are noticed. Your prayers mean something. Your prayers are, are words God's aware of. He's aware of your cries, just like you'd be aware of incense in a room. Now, presenting the incense inside the tabernacle, later on the temple, there were two main rooms. The first room was called the holy place or the sanctuary. And the priests alone could enter that. One of the kings, I think it might have been Uzziah, I'm trying to remember, I think it's Uzziah, tried to go in and offer incense and he became leprous. No, it's for the priests. Further inside, the next room you'd come to, separated by a thick veil or curtain, was the most holy place, called the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And inside this holy place, the first room, there were various items like the menorah, the candles, all that, which had the seven lampstands all on one big lampstand. And then opposite it was a table of showbread that held 12 loaves of bread for the priests. And as you went forward, you'd come to a small altar of incense, which was just before you'd come to the veil, right in front of it. The curtain was blocking the way into the Holy of Holies, which was in the next room where the Holy Ark of the Covenant was. Only the high priest, remember, could ever go into the Holy of Holies, and then only on the Day of Atonement, all by himself, remember. So incense was brought to the altar of incense, which was in the holy place, just before the, just in front of the veil, in front of the curtain. <clears throat> the priest would take a censer, They'd fill it with hot coals from the altar of burnt offerings or the sacrifices going on outside. And they would then place the burning coals into their censer. And they would carry that to the altar of incense in the holy place. They would then sprinkle the holy incense on top of into the fire of coals that they had in their censer. The incense would start to burn it would, it would produce a wonderful perfume smoke, fragrance, that would fill the room and probably waft through the veil into the Holy of Holies as well. Again, only descendants of Aaron, the priests, could offer the incense. Today, since we are considered priests in the New Covenant, we offer what the incense pictured, our prayers. They're holy, special, sweet-smelling to God. Yeah, your prayers. Your prayers are sweet-smelling to God. As much as you might think they're no good or don't measure up or not as good as you want them to be, they're a fragrant smell to God. 
the incense was presented twice a day. And hopefully we pray to God Most High and to the Son of God at least twice a day as well. Now, number one, what was incense? Incense was carefully prepared, treated with great respect, taken seriously, considered holy. Your prayers should be treated with great respect, taken seriously, and considered holy. I hope this sermon makes you think. Since we know it pictures our prayers, we should not be too flamboyant with our praying and our words. You can read more of this in Exodus 30, which we will soon. Exodus 30, 45 says that the, they were to be produced, this incense was to be produced by the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, holy. Turn now to Revelation 4. I want us to read the description of the heavenly throne of God that John the Apostle saw. So when you and I pray, it might be real good for us to once in a while, maybe two or three times a year, read Revelation 4. Refresh our mind. Revelation 4. Turn to Revelation 4. For this one, I'll read from the New Living Translation. And then I looked and I saw a door open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. And the voice said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must happen after this. A trumpet blast, you see. And instantly I was in the Spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven, and someone sitting on it. This is God the Father, of course, God Most High. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones like jasper and carnelian, and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a, th like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him. Twenty-four elders sat on those thrones. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with seven burning flames. These are the seven spirits of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. Read this again slowly, yourself, in your own language, in your own Bible, several times, so you really get the picture of what your prayers are coming into. In the center and around the throne were four living beings. I'm still reading Revelation 4, verse 6, the end of it. Four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. Don't think you'd like to meet these guys in a dark alley. <laughs> the first of these living beings was like a lion covered with eyes, remember. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living creatures, living beings, had six wings. And their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Forget these pictures you, you see, uh, paintings and whatnot of angels with a wing on each side of their shoulder going out far from them. Someone said there, there's no way you could ever fly with wings like that. The, the wings would have to be coming in more. But anyway, th these had six wings. And and with their wings were covered uh, all, all over with eyes. And day and night after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was who is, and who is still to come. And that's what Yehovah means, of course. I am who I am, the one who was and is and is still to come. And whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne, and they say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you, God the Father, you created all things. 
and they exist because you created what you pleased. Remember, God the Father is creator. He created through Jesus Christ, who is performing the Father's will. Always from the beginning did, always did when he came to earth, and always still does. He doesn't do his own will. We don't want to do our own will. We want to obey the one over us. You are worthy. And so Ephesians 3, 9 says that God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Of course, John 1, 1 and 2, 3 says that also. It's good to picture this sometimes. Revelation 4, when you pray, before you start. Not every time. But I'm just saying several times a year, read this. Really ponder it. Really let it settle into your mind that you have a picture. The priests were very careful about the fire and the incense. But there was a time when Aaron's two oldest boys, his two oldest sons, were not reverent about the incense, which pictures our prayers. And they offered strange fire, made God upset. And so fire from the altar, from God, burned them alive. Fire from the altar burned them alive. Turn to Leviticus 10, starting in verse 1. And then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer. Here we go again. Took his censer and put fire in it. Put incense on it, which are the prayers, remember. But offered a profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. They did something different. Whether they, whether they just made a, a different kind of incense or whether they were drunk, I don't know what happened. But they offered something that wasn't right. So fire went out, verse 2, from Jehovah and devoured them. And they died before Jehovah. Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come, I want you to pay attention and think about your prayers. By those who come near to me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. He, they weren't even allowed to mourn for these two. So I take this sermon very seriously. I've taken a lot of correction from it myself, my own sermon. I always preach to myself first. I think my praying has not always been as holy as it should be. Remember in whose presence you're coming. I want to read Leviticus 10, 3 again. The Lord said this, By those who come near to me, and the context is incense, the context is prayer, I must be regarded as holy. Before all the people, they must be glorified. So we must remember into whose presence we're coming. Maybe read Revelation 4 several times a year to get a picture of God's throne presence, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, one looking like an ox, a lion, and face of a man, and an eagle. <clears throat> and with the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, right there too, and hundreds of millions of powerful, angelic, holy, angelic beings, faithful ones, some with wings, some without, some with six wings, some with four wings, some looking like various animals we know some looking like men. These were not fat little cherubs or cherubs. They weren't just sweet little five-year-old girls with long hairs you see in depictions of angels. No, these are powerful beings. Many of them are warrior angels. And when we say, Father, Father in heaven, what a scene we're coming into. Even when you're praying a blessing on the food and the little children are there, be sure you tell them from time to time to remind them before whom we come. 
They should treat praying time as sacred, holy time. It's okay if your eyes are open or if your eyes are closed. The Bible doesn't say that we have to close our eyes. If our eyes are closed, I think we might not be as distracted as much. I remember I used to teach my, my children who are all now in their, they're all grown adults now with kids of their own. One of my small children once said to me, after the prayer for the food that I was praying, when it was over with, he, she, she said, Daddy, Daddy, Jonathan had his eyes open. Then I paused, and I said, Okay, how did you know that? <laughs> but anyway, so when they presented the correct spices, they were prepared. And after what happened to Nadab, who should have been the next high priest, they took it very seriously. We should also take praying before the greatest holy being in the universe very seriously. Be prepared for what we're doing. Don't be too casual. I'm not saying that, the, in fact, I gave a sermon on constant contact prayer that all through the day, just say, Father in heaven and talk to him. Sure. I'm talking about the, the formal praying times, two or three times a day on your knees, by your bed, face on the ground perhaps, or face in your bed or whatever. Those times are very sacred, holy times. And then all throughout the day, yeah, I, I, I make contact with God. Is it possible we're not getting as many answered prayers as we would like because we're too casual about our prayers? Hmm? What do you think? Remember, David said, let my prayer be set before you as incense. Psalm 141, 2. Bring your prayers to God, but be prepared. Remember to be holy, reverent, and pure. The priests went in with prepared incense, and they did it the right way. Okay, but what if you know you've sinned, and you really don't feel holy? You don't feel like a saint. And if you're like me, you don't even feel worthy to come before holy God or feel like he'll be happy to see you if you've done a really big boo-boo, a really bad sin. But by all means, come before him. But come as the publican did, who, whom we're told by Jesus himself could not even raise his eyes to heaven. Jesus may have seen someone like this praying outside the temple. But this publican just simply said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that man went home justified, made right, considered just, considered righteous in God's eyes. He went home righteous. So start your prayer, especially in a case like that, with repentance. He went home righteous. Does God even hear your prayers? Sometimes we wonder. I want to say again, admit it. There are times we wonder, is God even there? Does he hear me? There are times you wonder if your words are just stuck in your room. Get this, I've said it already, I'll say it again. You cannot be in a room filled with smoke and fragrance of incense without realizing it's filled with incense. You're aware it's filled with incense. You're aware of it. So, there are times you might wonder, but get this, God is very aware of your prayers. He's very aware of incense. He's aware of what you're presenting to him. He can't miss it. So is it okay to pray while you drive or do dishes or shave? Yeah. If it's done respectfully, of course. But do make sure you make time for some formal time of prayer too, I believe. Time when you set your prayers as incense before God on your knees. Daniel, we're told, prayed on his knees, beside your bed or face on the floor sometimes. Remember the word worship means to be bowed down. So number one, 
come before God remembering to whom you come, be prepared, come in a holy, respectful way. Okay, that's, that's point number one. So point number two, another lesson of incense. It was beaten down very fine. Our prayers should not be big chunks like, Father, heal all the sick. Remember to provide for the poor. Protect and inspire your ministers. Come soon, Jesus. Amen. That's what I call a big chunky prayer. God likes it broken down. Details, details, details. I like details. <laughs> keep telling my pastors in Kenya when I ask them a question, I want details. God does. In Exodus 30, verses 34 to 36, is all about the incense. Exodus 30, verses 34 to 36. Jehovah said to Moses, Take sweet spices, stakti, anika, galbanum, pure frankincense, with these sweet spices and there shall be equal amounts of each. I'm in Exodus 30, verse 35 now. You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine. Beat some of it very fine. And put some of it before the testimony, that's the ark, in the tabernacle of meeting, where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. Remember the testimony was the ark of the covenant. You can find that mentioned that way in Exodus 25, 16. You're coming to meet God. He wants details. He wants specifics. He wants it broken down fine. Your prayers, I mean. I do too when I ask for information from our faithful pastors in Kenya. Exodus 30, verse 36. I used to tell them, you know, get back with me with details. Don't make me chase you. I learned that from God. God's like that. Exodus 30, verse 36. Another translation say to beat it or grind this, this mixture into fine powder. Into fine powder. So when we pray, be specific about how you feel, specific about the request you're making, who needs to be healed, their names, the details. Be specific about the kind of answers you're asking from God. I got an email recently from a church leader in Tanzania saying they need Bibles. But he didn't tell me how many Bibles or what translation. The same man later said, we also badly need help to finish our meeting hall because it's so cold right now and rainy. But we have no money to finish it. But no specifics. Does he need doors? Does he need windows? How much money does he need? Don't pray to God that way. Give God specifics. And yes to all of you, I could sure use some help with more donors to provide Bibles, bathrooms. The same man said in his congregation of about 50 people, only two have Bibles. One is himself and one other family has a Bible. Out of 50 people, two Bibles. They can't afford to, to, to pay for Bibles. When you earn a dollar and a half or two dollars a day, if you're working, if you can find work, that's not even enough to feed the family all month long. So to buy a $12 Bible is really, really difficult. Some of you have helped me buy. We bought hundreds of Bibles because we have well over 1,200 people now uh, reporting in every Sabbath over in Kenya and Tanzania. And we, bought, we bought hundreds of Bibles. And so as another group contributed some as well. Bathrooms, latrines, windows, doors in their homemade meeting halls, paying the cost of our faithful pastors to go visit, travel to outlying areas. 
our pastors who are all teachers, they make about $125 a month, 20,000 Kenya shillings. That's about $31 a week, and that's considered way more than the average. Most of the brethren there make less than half that much. There's no money left to travel to the feast or buy a Bible. So yes, I'll thank you now if you would send us some help. And I feel overloaded so many times. Praise God for the small handful of people who do send some financial help there, here and there. And I keep praying specifically, God, please send more donors. We just need the, 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 these African people, the least of these, my brethren. They need so many things. They need food. They need sometimes medical help. Praise God for some of you donating money for Bibles for these incredibly poor Africans who want to worship God. I could sure use your help. I could sure use your help. Thank you very much. But anyway, be specific. I hope I was specific to you. <laughs> but be specific. Point number three. Point number two is be specific. Break it down fine. Incense was broken down fine like fine powder. Now we're point number three. Incense was offered twice a day. Perhaps pray more than you ever have been before. At least two formal times a day. And then as you go about your business, many more times, maybe not formal times, but many more contacts with God. Exodus 30, verses 7 to 9. Exodus 30, verses 7 to 9. Let's turn over there. Aaron shall burn on it, the altar of incense, sweet incense every morning. Every morning when he tends the lamps. That's important too to note. He shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense that keeps going on, before Jehovah throughout your generations. And you shall not offer a strange incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. No, just incense. The incense, like our prayers, was offered when they trimmed the lamps. That's what it says in the afternoon. God's word is like a lamp unto our feet. So you combine Bible study with prayer. In fact, before you begin your Bible study, just bow your head right there at your desk, or wherever you are, and ask God to open your eyes to see, open your heart to understand, and to appreciate his wonderful truths. Thank him for his good word, for his lamp, the word of God. And as you speak to God in prayer to bless your Bible study of his word, ask him to truly speak to you by this Bible study. Speak to you while you study, even while you're praying. When I pray, I like to have, a lot of times I like to have a pad of paper by me and write down stuff that sometimes it's just clearly not my own thoughts. I'll just stop praying and just ask God, your turn, please. I've been gabbing on here. Please, you talk to me. And I'll be, sh I'll shut up. I'll be quiet. Prayer is a two-way conversation, remember, when it's done right. Anyway, Exodus 30, verse 8, incense shall be called a perpetual incense. Pray always, many times a day. You've done the, you presented the incense, but it keeps on burning until the next morning. When some more fresh incense is put in twice a day in formal prayer. And don't be flippant in your prayers or too casual. In Daniel 6, verse 10, we're told that Daniel knelt down three times a day, every day. Three times, knelt down on his knees. In Psalm 55, verse 16 and 17, here's what David says. Psalm 55, 16 and 17. As for me, I will call upon God, and Jehovah shall save me. Evening, morning, and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Psalm 119, 
verses 163 and 164. Psalm 119, 163, 164. I hate and abhor lying. I do too. I'm going to give a sermon on that. There's so much lying going on. But I love your law. Seven times a day. Verse 164. Psalm 119, the long psalm. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. I think we need to be praying more, much more. A quickie prayer is better than none at all, I guess. But let's commit, all of us, please commit to respecting our prayer times so much more than, and committing to having much more prayer times than we've ever had before. Show God you want to talk to Him. Show God you love Him. Can't wait to talk to Him. He loves that. Just as a loving father loves to hear his kids shout out when he comes home, Daddy's home, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. And they come run up to you and jump into your arms, hug you. As they come running to you, they have their arms lifted up to you, their father. God loves it when we lift up our hands and come to him and say, Father in heaven. Father in heaven. And to start the day with, thank you, dear Abba, for another day alive to serve you. You might have aches and pains. You might have an illness. You might be sick. But if you're still alive, thank him for another day to serve him. Give him that joy. Come reverently before him. Break your prayers down fine to find details. Know he's very aware of your presence and your words and come to him many times a day. God's children, you, love talking to him. The body of Christ is a praying church. We fight on our knees. We go forward on our knees. We pray a lot. That's God's people. I hope this has moved you to evaluate, reevaluate your praying time. Give God wonderful glory. Give God a wonderful, fragrant aroma. The incense of your prayers. May your prayers be set before him as incense. Glory to God. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.